is Celine, and I have a degree in music. Um, yeah, thanks. Actually, I'm really glad that was y'all's response to that joke, because I, in retrospect, it's kind of a joke in poor taste, um, but I, I keep trying it anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my name's Celine. I'm a software engineer at uh, a company called Braintree in Chicago. Um, I'm putting my information up here now uh, in case you like want to write it down, have any questions. Feel free to reach out. I love making new friends. Um, also, I love feedback, uh, so if you have any feedback for me, um, these are really great forums to give them to. I'm going to post this again at the end of the talk. Um, so... This is great. Um, this is kind of a talk about computer science. Um, how many people, I imagine maybe there are at least a few people in the audience who have um, at least heard of structure and interpretation of computer programs, the scheme of, yeah, 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 cool. Um, has anyone in the audience watched the video lectures that are posted on the MIT open source version of it? It was a crapshoot. Um, I watched half of the first one and then haven't really picked it back up again. I think hopefully some of you guys can relate to that experience. Um, but it did really strike me. There's a gentleman named Hal Abelson, I think, is the person who gives that lecture. Um, it looks like it's from the 80s. It's really fantastic, and I love a lot of the things that he says in it. He says, welcome to this class on computer science, except that that's not really a good name for it because it's not really science, and it's not really about computers. Um, so. You know, there, there are reasons that we call it that. Um, he, he then likens it to the study of geometry, which um, was developed initially by the ancient Egyptians. Uh, the name for it comes from Gaia, which means Earth, and Metron, which means to measure. It was developed as a way of, like, surveying land. Um, got to peek at my notes. Um, so much like the ancient Egyptians developed these sort of rudimentary, rudimentary like fundamentals of geometry, um, geometry then developed into a way of talking precisely about declarative knowledge, a way of, of talking about what is true. Uh, Mr. Abelson says that he believes that centuries from now people will look back at those 20th century primitives and think like, oh yeah, those folks were fiddling around with these gadgets called computers but really they were developing a formalized process, uh, a formalized way to talk about intuitions about process. Um, and I really like that. I've heard it said elsewhere that computer science is a study of process. Um, and I think that if that's true, then programming is the application of that study, uh, or at least one, of, one application of that study. Um, as I mentioned, I have a degree in music and as such, I've been noticing a lot of musicians in the field since I uh, transitioned into uh, tech. H how many people in the audience today like dabble in music or know a little bit about it? Cool. Is there anyone in the audience who feels like they really don't know anything about music? Awesome. I'm so glad that there are both, both uh, people who identify with both sides here. I'm hoping that this talk um, will be very clear to all of us in the room because it approaches things from the code side. Um, <clears throat> um, another, another idea I want to call out before we get started proper is um, I went to Strange Loop this year uh, and there was a talk given by a gentleman named Chris Ford. He talked about um, ethnomusicology, African polyrhythms uh, and polyphony and I really, really enjoyed a lot of the way that he talked about these ideas. He talked specifically about um, some aspects that music have in common to uh, programming, um, and that is that they both use an abstract form of representation um, to communicate ideas. Uh, they both use this abstract form of representation to communicate ideas about a process. Um, and then there's also a lot of like composition and analysis in, in both pieces. And I think this is probably true of many other fields as well, but perhaps obviously the reason I noticed it in music is because I studied music for most of my life. Um, so <clears throat> what we're going to do today in this talk is we're going to look at one piece of music. Um, it was written by a gentleman named Steve Reich, uh, published in 1973. It's part of an era of academic music called minimalism. 
And you can maybe see just from looking at this page why it's called minimalism, um, especially if you do have any kind of background or experience with music. Like a lot of classical music pieces take up an entire book, um, and this one is half a page. Uh, so it is just in appearance very minimalistic. Um, we're going to deconstruct the, the representation on this page some of the more traditional uh, musical representation that we see here. We're gonna deconstruct the process and figure out how to describe it conceptually, and then we're gonna recompose that process using a tool that's familiar to all of us, Ruby code. Um, and we're gonna use Sonic Pi uh, to help with that process, um, but I'm not gonna focus too much on that tool. We can talk about it after uh, if y'all want to. Um, great. <sighs> I'm really excited, let's get going. So, uh, in beginning to break down this piece, uh, the first thing I want to point out is that there are five of what we call stanzas. Each stanza is this like broader line. We read music, just in case anyone doesn't know, we read music from left to right, top to bottom. Um, each of the stanzas is made up of two parts. You can see them delineated in the top left-hand corner uh, with the words clap one and clap two. This indicates that there are two performers in the piece and the instrument is clapping which is not terribly common in the world of academic music, um, just to point that out. So each stanza has two lines, which represent two parts. There are five stanzas. Um, the next thing I want to point out is a structure that um, formal music calls a bar or a measure. Um, in each of these broader stanzas, there are three bars or measures. Um, and appropriately enough, those are delineated by these like vertical bars in between each group of notes, right? Um, <laughs> cool, one, two, three, four, right, we got that. Um, next, I wanna bring your attention to the top of the page where we see a little piece of instructions here. The first bit of this that's like got a, a, a note and it says equals 160, 184, that's just a tempo marking. We're not gonna worry too much about that for the purposes of this talk. Um, after that though, it says repeat each bar 12 times. Th that's instructions from the composer. If you look down at each of these bars or measures in the score, you can see little colons on each line. Um, traditionally in music, when you, you read like a few bars of music and you come to the colon, that means repeat from where you see the first colon that's facing to the right. Um, and in this case, Steve Reich has given us very specific instructions. He's saying, don't repeat the way you normally would, just once, repeat it 12 times. That's how this is meant to be read. Um, disclaimer here, we're not gonna repeat it 12 times. We're gonna repeat it four times, because this is my talk, and I think 12 is too many for this talk. Um, fantastic. So one last thing I wanna point out before we move on is that the top part has exactly the same pattern of notes in every measure. It plays the same thing the whole time. Um, and that is arguably the boring part of the piece, but it's also a really important, um, important part of the piece. It gives the changing part something to work against. Um, let's take a closer look at that first measure where both parts are the same. And let's break down some of the representation we see in here. So, despite the way this looks, it looks like these are lots of different notes, but don't be fooled. This musical notation is a little bit weird. Um, I always thought it was crazy how inconsistent um, the way that notes like, like visually are represented. Uh, but these are all, all these notes represent exactly the same rhythmic value. Um, and in fact, the little markings between the notes, uh, those are called rests, they kind of look like flags. Um, those also represent the same rhythmic value, uh, which is kind of cool because it's the only, looking back at the whole score, those are the only notes and rests in the entire piece. Um, that coupled with the fact that it's a rhythmic piece makes this piece really easy to represent in code because we don't have to worry about pitch at all and we don't have to worry about different rhythmic values even. We just have to worry about the order in which the rhythmic values appear. Um, so that's kind of neat. Um, and I, I do want to, I want to play this 
um, rhythmic pattern to you because it's it's really the theme of the piece. You hear it a lot, a lot, a lot. It goes like this. <clears throat> I'm gonna do that again, and I'm gonna emphasize the rests with my hands. Um, I like thinking of rests in music as white space, coming at it from a code perspective. Okay. Cool. Um, and I also, I have a mnemonic for that, because um, I found that, especially like in teaching music, uh, lyrics make it a lot easier to remember rhythms and melodies and stuff. Um, so I've got a fun story behind this. Um, I was a big fat choir nerd when I was in college. Um, and my college choir used to go on tour every winter break. And being music nerds, um, we, we sat in the back of the bus one year and um, tried to, to learn how to play this piece of clapping music. Because all it takes is a couple people, hands, and familiarity with the process of the piece. So we'd sit, sit in the back of the bus and play clapping music, and we came up with um, these lyrics that I'm about to share with you. Um, with good reason, I think anyone who has ever been on a tour bus for more than a couple days uh, understands the sentiment that these lyrics express. They go like this. There is no pooping on the bus. <laughs> so now you have a really easy way to remember this thematic rhythm. We'll get back to that. Um, <laughs> another really fun thing about this really simple representation is that there is perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps an obvious way um, definitely a very simplistic way to represent this in code, um, and particularly in Ruby code, and that's with arrays. I've chosen to represent here the first part with one array on top and the second part with another array on bottom. Uh, and appropriately enough, I've chosen to represent the spaces where there is a note or a clap with a one and the spaces where there isn't with a zero. Gotta love parallelism. Cool. So. Let's now take a look at the rest of the score. Past the first measure, um, I've already pointed it out, but you may, you may have noticed as well that the second part changes throughout the piece. Um, and, spoiler alert, it's a recursive pattern. Um, so, before we move on breaking down uh, notes and process, let's be really aggressive about defining our terms and make sure that we talk from a broad perspective about what recursion is. Um, is there a brave soul in the audience who might want to volunteer their own definition of recursion? Go for it. Self-reference? Yeah, I really like that, self-reference. That's a good way of putting it. There are so many different definitions. This is the first one I found. I'm doing that Wikipedia thing. Um, and th this particular definition is, I think, more particular, it's, it's more honed into um, computers um, than what you uh, offered up. Um, and that's really common. We're all familiar with the, the computer-based reference uh, or definition of recursion. So I went and found another one which um, tries to be really particular to mathematics. Um, but I really like the part of this that says it's, uh, recursion is generated by repeating a particular operation. And I think of like examples of recursion that occur outside of mathematics or computers, like when two mirrors are facing each other, that's arguably recursion. Um, and what is the repeated operation here? It's, it's reflecting. They're reflecting each other across. Um, and there, I mean, there's no kick in mirror reflecting, but that doesn't matter. Um, so I, I like this definition specifically because it's not particular to computers. And what we're trying to do here is build a bridge across two different fields um, by analyzing similar processes. Uh, so thinking of it as a repeated operation serves our purpose really well for that. Cool, um, so looking again at the rest of the score, the second part, we know it's a recursive process. Let's see if we can pinpoint that repeated operation. Um, and let's do that by taking a closer look at the second measure. Um, this measure, we've established that the first part is the same, so we have an idea of what, because it's only the second measure, we have an idea of what the part was in the measure right before it, and we can look at the second part and figure out exactly what happens. Again. Do I have a brave soul in the audience who might want to volunteer uh, if they've noticed what this repeated operation is? <laughs> 
Yeah. The whole pattern has been shifted back, and the first note has been placed at the end of the bar. Very well said, sir. Thank you. Um, cool. And that just keeps going until the end of the piece. Uh, but we'll, I'll take another look at that later. I keep getting ahead of myself. Um, we can represent the, these, these notes and rhythms and patterns in uh, code again fairly easily. Same thing. Ones represent a clap. Zeros represent a rest. Um, and as a side note, I just I really like the way it looks when they are different because you can see where the beats line up with each other and where they're doubled, and it's great. Um, cool. So taking a look at the rest of the piece, it's easy to visualize the way that that operation is repeated throughout the piece. Um, and you can sort of trace the lines through the piece if you'd like to and land at the very last measure in the fifth stanza where they return to playing the same pattern again. Cool. Um, so now we get to get into the, the part where we sort of figure out how to recompose this process. I think we've got a solid understanding of what the process is overall. How do we recompose this with code? What needs representation? There are the two parts, the two performers, um, that'll need some kind of representation. There's what they're playing, the notes on the page. We've already started with that a little bit. And then there's also how to play the parts, that process. How do we represent that in code? We have a conceptual understanding of it. How do we represent that with the tools that we're already familiar with? Um, so I've taken the liberty of uh, establishing a couple pieces of this already. Um, there's the two parts. Um, I, I will take just a small minute to say uh, Sonic Pi is a DSL over Ruby, and there are a couple of weird quirks to it in that regard. Um, and so uh, I have not defined any of this within a class like perhaps you normally would in object-oriented Ruby, but I'm still using instance variables, so there. Um, <laughs> So I've assigned two different uh, packaged voices to these two instance variables. We've got a high-pitched uh, percussive voice and a mid-pitched percussive voice. And this is just to provide us a little bit of texture and variety because, um, in part because it's a computer, they're coming from the same speakers, if it was the same pitch, it would be a little bit harder to differentiate between parts. Honestly, I don't think this helps too much, but it does help a little bit. Um, and then we've already established that we have the baseline part. I was supposed to deliver that differently so that I could focus on the pun a little bit more. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah, I've, I've called our, our part that stays the same the baseline. Um, and then we have what is aptly named a rotating part. Um, I thought I deleted the clone. I figured out that wasn't absolutely necessary. But fortunately for us, Ruby has um, a packaged method in it that will do exactly the operation we needed to do. It's called rotate. Um, it's beautiful. Lastly, the interesting part, not that the rest of this hasn't been interesting, um, but I really like recursion and it's fun to play with. And we get to do that now. So let's redefine some of these important terms um, for anyone who, who might be watching this um, who is not familiar with music. I think this is an important thing to do. Um, we've got our measures or bars, which is a grouping of notes. We've got a section. Um, I haven't said this word before. I'm calling um, the repetition of measures a section. Remember in the score when he said, repeat each, repeat each measure 12 times? That's, that's what I'm calling a section. Um, we're repeating it four times, as a reminder. Um, I just couldn't really think of a better way of describing that. So a section, a repeated section. Um, and then I... I've defined a couple of methods for us to start with, play note and play rest. They're fairly straightforward just because every note and every rest is the same rhythmic value um, and it's not really that interesting or important to the process, so you're welcome. Um, other helper methods I think would be a good way to move forward. I'm proposing that, that um, the design of this particular recomposition, uh, we tell the computer how to play a measure, how to play a section, and then how to play both parts playing a section at the same time. Um, normally, if two humans were clapping this piece, it would be two separate brains performing one process together. 
Um, a computer arguably can be two separate brains. There's not really a basis of comparison there, uh, or there is, but I don't want to get into it. And um, we have to tell the computer how to play two parts at the same time. So for playing the measure, um, this, we, we take two arguments, the pattern of notes that we want to play and the voice that we want to play them. Um, so for each value in this pattern, if it's a one, we play the note with the voice given, and if it's a zero, we play the rest. And that, I can tell you what that sounds like. At least I think I can. There we go. Great. That makes sense, we already learned that rhythm. So then, uh, to play the section, there are so many different ways to, um, to uh, implement um, this. I, I did it this way for reasons. Um, I think probably if it were in a class, you would want to extract the number into um, a constant or something like that. But this is how it turned out, and the code works. It still sounds like things, and I think that's really fun. It sounds like this. Make sense so far? Great. And then lastly, um, we know how to tell the computer uh, to play both parts at the same time. Um, and we'll do that a section at a time because that kind of makes sense to the, the structure of this process. Um, and in Sonic Pi, the way that's done is that we just wrap one play section call in a thread and then let the other play. Um, and that's, I think it's kind of neat the way it works. Um, but it also makes sense. You can just tell it to have a separate process and, and go. So that sounds, oh, do what I tell you. That sounds like this. Cool, and um, just for a little context, I'll, I'll shout, shout back to the thing I was saying earlier. This is one part. Is that one part? Yeah. And this is two parts. Cool. So maybe you can hear the difference. Um, to me, it just sounds a little bit louder. It becomes more obvious when they're playing different things. I have to go back to the slide. There we go. Um, da -da -da -da. Now it's time for the curtain. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. I'm obviously very excited about this part. Um, let's continue to be uh, thorough about defining our terms and just go over the pieces of recursion. Um, we've already been so good about defining terms anyway, so let's, uh, let's do that right now. Um, recursion, uh, in, in my mind anyway, recursion is typically broken down into uh, three or so parts. There's the part where the function is called within itself. Um, there is the kick often also called the base case, you might be familiar with either of those names, um, that tells the function to exit um, after a certain point of repeating the operation. And then there's the part of it that uh, changes something so that it can get to the kick. Um, and often that's, uh, you can think of it in a couple different ways. There is the repeated operation itself, the part that the function's meant to call. Um, the classic example is, is in the factorial problem. Um, the thing that the function does is multiply two numbers, and the thing that the function changes is that one of the numbers is subtracted by one every time it repeats, um, if that makes sense. Cool. So we're gonna start with the obvious part written for us um, with this very aptly named method, play recursive bit. Um, we, we pass in a part that we want it to play recursively, um, and then we, we call the method within itself, um, and we'll get to what we pass into the repeated call in a minute. Oh, I just gave it away. Um, so then we have the base case, which is, um, did, did anyone notice this earlier? Any, any volunteers to interpret the code I have on screen? Go for it. Right, exactly. The very last measure they line up again. 
Um, so we know we're done with the recursive process when the two parts line up again and are playing the same thing. Um, and incidentally, Steve Reich called this piece and a lot of other similar pieces that he wrote phase music for exactly that reason, um, because it, it's like, uh, it, it, it's phasic. Um, you start with one thing and you kind of rotate through a phase and then it stops. Uh, it's really neat. Um, right, so next, uh, what's the change that we want to pass into uh, to the recursive call? Go for it. Exactly. Rotating part dot rotate. Um, and, and that'll, well, you guys know, that signals our, our thing that it needs to change and it'll keep going until the base case. We just need one more piece, which is the actual like action that we want um, to happen. Any takers, any, yeah? Yeah, play the section, sweet. Um, so we've told both parts to play the section. Um, we are returning when the piece is done, um, but when it's not done, we're just gonna keep playing it um, with the part rotated. So let's put all these pieces together. We could potentially just use the method we just wrote, play recursive bit, um, and pass in a rotated baseline. But there's one problem with that. Um, any, any takers, does anyone already know? I see a hand halfway raised in back, maybe? Yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, the, the problem with doing it this way uh, is that as, as the gentleman in back said, the first section you want it to play is gonna be the same. Um, it won't immediately exit because we're passing in the rotated baseline, it just won't actually play the whole piece, right? So we'll want to play the section the same way first and then go through the recursive bit until the kick. Um, and you could, you could arrange the actual recursive method a little bit differently so that the kick is at the top and it just doesn't play again um, when, when they're the same, and, but then you would have to put both parts play section at bottom and you know, it doesn't really matter, it's the same thing. Um, fantastic, so we're gonna listen to this all at the same time. Um, the way the piece is arranged, it ends up like just feeling really good at the end of it, so I wanna go through some thank yous and post some links before we start listening to it. Um, so I've got a link to Sonic Pi because it's a, a really neat little DSL. Uh, if anyone wants to explore that, do it. Um, I've got the completed code up on my GitHub as well as my, a PDF of my slides. I'm using Dexset, there's a markdown up there too if anyone's interested. Um, the name of the composer and the piece up there, again, if anyone's interested. Uh, and I do wanna thank a couple of my coworkers who helped, uh, who helped me prepare and mentored me through this process, uh, John Downey and Josh, Josh Larson. I wanna thank Dev Bootcamp for initially asking me to give a talk about music and programming and inspiring this. Um, and then of course, I, Sam Aaron and anyone who's ever contributed to Sonic Pi, um, I like it a lot. Cool. So, let's do, so in doing this, I'm gonna pull Sonic Pi over here to the viewer. I'm gonna make this a little smaller, I hope. There we go. Um, I've written in a logging method. Um, it'll tell us when the base case is achieved and also just write out each part uh, the first time it's played so that we can see that visual of each note against each other and how the rotation is occurring. Um, yeah, let's do it. 
you. Um, does anyone have any questions? That's a good, that's a very good question. I wish I could. Um, you mean like out of different speakers? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, the question is, can we play the bass line out of one speaker and the rotating part out of another speaker so it's a little bit easier to hear the difference? Um, and I would like to figure out um, what the best way is to do that. As it was, we had a little bit of trouble with the line out on the computer, and the sounds that you heard were provided to you by a microphone sitting next to the speaker. Uh, so um, that is very good feedback. I'll, I'll keep that in mind um, for if I give this talk another time and, and try to make that improvement. Thank you. Oh, that's a great question. The, what is the editor that I'm using to write the, the code in there? Or Yeah. Um, so that, that's built into Sonic Pi. Um, Sonic Pi was uh, originally developed uh, for use on Raspberry Pi, but they developed like an uh, OS X port for it. Um, I'm honestly not a huge fan of the editor in Sonic Pi, um, especially after having learned and gotten used to Vim. I'm like trying to like, even, even I used to use Sublime, even like all the keyboard shortcuts in Sublime, they're just, maybe there are keyboard shortcuts in Sonic Pi and I just didn't take the time to learn them, but um, I, I became mildly frustrated when I was developing this at like having to like copy and paste with a mouse and like click on things. <laughs> um, that said though, it's, uh, I didn't have to write my own system of turning code into sound, which was really nice. Um, thanks again so much for coming.